Sir Frederick Smith, or Sleepy Smith, as he's familiarly known to all Barbadians, is a beloved husband, father, and grandfather. He's also one of Barbados's favorite sons of the soil. The son of a school teacher, he rose from poverty to achieve the highest honor this country can bestow on a citizen, Knight of St. Andrew. And through it all, he has remained true to himself. The man in the street is no different from me. Some have fluffed their opportunities. But if you stick him, he's going to bleed. If you push his heart, he's going to die. So my position is thus that I have been more privileged in many ways than many, but they're no different. They're God's creation. Every single human being is a creature of God. And what, 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 what are you? Life is like a vapor, like the grass, mown today and gone. So why should, must you put, why do people put on airs? When I find that local black people treat some of their employees worse than the white Englishman did, it hurts me. Because you're just a human being and to be nice doesn't take anything off you. To meet and drink and mix with fellow with the average man is not is no crime. I mean, if you want to be like Jesus, you have to do that. When Jesus touched the leper, you know people were stunned. See, you don't touch leper, he was aware. But Jesus touched him. You understand what I'm saying? So, so to me, being humble and being, it's, it's part of your Christianity. To be humble, to, to love your fellow man, because the greatest command, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So Frederick is the second of 10 children, five boys and five girls, born in St. Augustine, St. George. And we were very poor. My grandmother was a cook. I couldn't read and write if Barbados was as big as this house. She couldn't read and write, but you can rob her with money. She was a cook at Chrissy Bathurst, the politician, for 63 years. Even when I came back as a young lawyer, I said, Grand, come home, you're disgracing me. She said, no, you got to lift me from here. And this was true, we had to move her. But Chrissy Bathurst was very nice to us. When we were at Harrison College, if we had friends, he allowed us to use the drawing room. Although for lunch we had to eat in the servant's room. And he knew that she was teething the food to feed these children, me and my brother, who went to Comba Mare. He and his siblings recognized from early that the only way out of poverty would be through education. So it was really rough. The white man controlled everything, the business. Even to get a job in the Bridgetown, you had to be fair. Cash boys call it. So that for a poor black boy, it was, it was tough. And the only method of escaping was through education. Unfortunately for my family, we all were average or above average. So we succeeded that way. And of course, my father took an interest in our learning. Of course, in those days, if the teacher beat you, your mother would beat you if you complained. So you just had to learn. It was the only way to get escape from the drudgery of, of those days. It changed a lot since independence, but prior to that, Barbados was the nearest thing to South Africa that you could come across pre-Mandela. And therefore education, that is why I always have a high respect for Barra. Because he saw, like I saw, that education was the avenue through which the poor black man could have social mobility. Sir Frederick took full advantage of the educational opportunities that came his way. I went to Cornwall first in 1934, me and my brother. The old man was working for $36 a month and had to pay $16 a term for the two of us, which was hernia, I could tell you. But he persevered, he used to keep a cow and sheep. In those days you could keep animals, you know, yard fowls, we, as though got a different meaning. But in those days we had yard fowls. My, I had to come home from school, take off my school clothes, graze my sheep by the side of the road. We used to keep rabbits, the old lady take the cuckoo stick, and you could get an extra soup. And soup, of course, was the best because it could stretch. You know, you, just, you get a taste of chicken, you get a taste of... I used to love to see a foul cock chase a hen cross the road and a car hit it. Because you get an extra soup. That day, because Wednesday was mutton, Saturday the butcher would kill a pig, so Sunday you would get roast pork and peas and rice. From Combermere, he went to Harson College. He entered Codrington College after a brief stint in the army and gained a BA degree. Then he went off to England to study law. Why law? Because it was the only profession, if an engineer 
I had to work with a white man. If I was an architect, I had to work with an Englishman. If I was a, the only two professions, and that's why Barbados were made law and medicine that gave you independence. You couldn't get a job in a white engineering firm. You couldn't get a job as an architect. Cause people, black people, they had no money to build houses like they have today. So the only way to be, have independence was law or medicine. Well, law, medicine was seven years, law was three. And I was very fortunate that I got through in two and a half years because I had a degree from Codrington College. And it wasn't that difficult at that time. Now the demand that you get an LLB before you do law. In those days, you could go straight to the Inns of Court, take the professional exams, and if you passed, you got through. It's not by accident that all the Smith brothers gained professional degrees. Sir Frederick proudly declares that the firm of Smith & Smith did not start with the law firm, but with five brothers banding together to help one another along the way. My first brother, Ivan, who did his PhD at, Corn at, uh, at McGill, he wanted to do medicine. So we sat down and decided, well, what, how are we going to manage this? And then I said, well, we're going to send you, Fred, to London, to England to do law. When you come back, you will help the others. But when I, time I come back, meantime Ivan had studied and had got his external London degree. And therefore he found that seven years in medicine was too long. So he decided to pursue his interest in geography and got his PhD from McGill. When I came back, I remember daddy driving me down one day to Constant Plantation to beg Mr. Robinson, Sir Stanley Robinson, as he later became, to give my brother, Ori, who was headmaster of law school, a Buckley scholarship to get into Harrison College. And then I helped my brother, Vernon, and my other brother, Lionel, uh, who became chief educator, uh, who got his PhD from Cornell. I helped them in their universities. But we sat down, and this is the only way, because, I mean, they helped me, and I didn't get my brother's check at the end of the month. I was like a fish out of water. I had to borrow or eat just bread of water, because I studied law in England on 17 pounds a month. As soon as my brother, teaching at Carmel Merrill Foundation, got his check, he would off to me. He was called to the English bar in 1952, and then came home where he joined forces with another young attorney, Errol Barrow. It was an alliance which embraced both law and politics. Errol Barrow took me under his wing. I slept with Errol Barrow down at Land's End, and I was, Errol Barrow let me drive his little triumph. Errol Barrow would give me cases to cut my teeth on. And when I came back, and Errol Barrow came back, the poor black man was working for nothing. I mean, very little. He is the one, we couldn't get any cases from the big law white firms with, with Keith, so Keith, Keith Walker around, Jack Dare. Barbados was still the social class sort of thing. And they all knew your background, who your father was, your mother was, and so on. And so politics, the man who gave me a case would give me a vote. And was similarly with Errol Barra, and we defended the man in the street. Our, our whole practice and our reputation, Barron Smith, came from defending poor people who thief cow thief to, to live. And that is how we existed. So we felt that if he is going to give you a case to help you make a living and eat a bread, he could give you a vote too if you supported him in his ambitions and his hopes. So that it was just a step of, because we, I, I never got any work from Cottle Cat for Yarwood and Boyce or none of them, unless the client specifically said, give it to Sleepy Smith. It was a sort of tied up thing. I mean, you get the dropping the, from the rich man's table, the crumbs. So the man in the street was the man who gave you a living, who helped you to put bread on your table. Then came the decision to form their own political party. When we came back, there was only two parties. Grant Lee Adams, the Barbados Labour Party, and the Conservative, headed by Motley and Fred Goddard and the group. We joined and used to attend meetings to the Barbados Labour Party. But then, in the course of time, we'd been much younger than Sir Grantly. We realized that Sir Grantly was, he was a constitution matter to him. Economics, which Barron knew about, but economics didn't matter to Sir Grantly. Sir Grantly relied on Sir Archibald Cuke for sugar and for a thing, and Kenneth Hunt for manufacturing. 
he was concentrating on getting us, getting us adult suffrage and moving the Constitution to the Bush experiment. But we found that he just followed the colonial office. Apart from that, in 1948, he had gone to Paris backing the British and colonialism. We didn't hold that against him, so we came back. We found that he was so tied up with the governor, who was not our friend. The governor was an Englishman sent down here to keep the blacks in, 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 in subjection. And we couldn't stand for this. And we told it apparently so. So when we were kicked out of the Barbados Labour Party, but we couldn't appeal, we just had to leave. But we couldn't join. Under no circumstances could we join the Conservative. We couldn't join Motley and Fred Gordon and that group. How could we, Herbert Dowden? How could we? So where are we going? We're still in politics. We're interested in politics. We had to form our own party. So 24 of us got together down at Land's End and formed the Democratic Labour Party, of which I was the first chairman. First elected to Parliament in 1956 to represent the parish of St. Andrew, he later took a break from politics to get married and moved to Jamaica, where he worked first as a Crown Council and then as a magistrate. And one day in 66, just after the election, sitting on the bench, the orderly, my orderly says, uh, I've got an overseas call for you. And it was inviting me to come back as Attorney General. I left Jamaica in 72 hours. I said, well, you ring Donald Sanks to the Prime Minister. I'm going down, to, I adjourn my cases and tell the Chief Justice I leave him. You just send the ticket. And Barra sent the ticket and I left. This was a Friday he spoke to me and Monday, I, Tuesday I was here. And Wednesday I, I went to Government House, sworn in as Minister of State in the Prime Minister's office and became Attorney General on Independence. And I gave up a lot of money because when I was, when Barra, uh, invite, Errol Barra invited me to come home, I was working for 2,000 pounds a year. I came back when ministers were getting 1,850 pounds a year and my wife lost money. So I, I sacrificed, but I felt that it's better to be Attorney General of a poor system than an underling in a big country. And so to me, being Attorney General, I had seen big attorney generals for this body, for that body. I felt that this was a chance not only to serve my country, but to be somebody in my own country. And so I had no hesitation. My wife, I didn't tell my wife I was coming because I wanted to be somebody in my own country. And thank God I've achieved that. The one post that eluded him in his political career was that of prime minister. Well, I would have liked to have been prime minister of my country. I think anybody who's in politics would love that honor. And I, but not getting it uh, is, not, is not a regret because it can only be one at a time. Uh, and uh, I say, I would have been, uh, I would have had a fight if Errol Barra, after 76, when he had led us into independence and lost, he had left politics. I would not, I would have been fighting like a Kentucky mule. But in view of the fact that he, and I knew, and that's why a lot of people don't understand, you see, politics, you've got to look at the people's views and the people's interests, but you also have your own life to consider. I knew that as long as Errol Barra could stand on two feet, I could not be prime minister in his time. He was led us into independence, he was so respected and so on. So when I looked at it and said, well, 76, I'm leader of the opposition. If we lose 10 years down the line and the DLP gets back in, who's going to be prime minister? Harold Barr, as long as he is alive and still in parliament. And he, had, he would get back in, because I could get back in, you know what I mean? I've never lost an election in my term. I got in 56, then I ran to and got in. But what I'm saying is, what's the sense if you can't be prime minister? You're 10 years older, and as it turned out, 81, Tom got one in 76, Tom won in 81, Tom lost in 86. Who is Prime Minister? Harold Barr. So I would have been fighting as leader of the opposition for 10 years, but not being able to get the top prize. I'm 10 years older. So what to say? So I just decided I resign. Because I can't see if Errol had left. I'd be leader of the opposition. I would be fighting and positioning myself to be prime minister if and when we get back. Don't mind how many years passed, but as long as he was around, 
it was obvious to anybody, a blind man on a trotting horse, that he would be prime minister again. It's simple as that. The other post that eluded him, and one he readily admits is his only real regret, is that of Governor General. That's the only post to culminate my career. Not so much prime minister as governor general. It is the highest post you represent Her Majesty. And I find that after all these years in Barbados, there are people dying every day who have never seen government house. And I would have tried to make let everybody, I, I'm a different, I'm not an Englishman, and I have English traditions, I am going to be respectful, I'm going to maintain the dignity of the office, but I am a Bayesian, and I would like to have made that, that, that change, that, you know, from picnic, see you, see you. That's the only regret I have. The height of his legal career was his appointment as one of the first judges of the Court of Appeal of Barbados. I served on the Court of Appeal for five years. We were one of the first judges because we didn't have a Court of Appeal. We just had, had a, uh, a, the high court sitting on one another, a sort of back-scratching sort of system. Well, Erskine Sandyford established a separate court before I, I sat on you, you sat on me. So if I was rude to you today, you can be rude to me tomorrow. Now the Court of Appeal was a different setup and separate and distinct. And to be one of the first judges of that was the climax to my career. Apart from that, I was Chief Justice of Turks and Caicos, non-resident. Her Majesty appointed me and I was Chief Justice for four years. In addition to that, I delivered the judgment. I was President of the Court of Appeal of Grenada and deliver the judgment in the Morris Bishop Appeal. So that I ha have had, and then I was Assistant Attorney General of, of Cameroon, West Cameroon, so that I've had a l l sort of experience from a legal point of view. Politically, my ambition was to be Prime Minister, and I agree with Branford Tate. If you don't have the ambition or ability to be Prime Minister, in no sense going into politics. I mean, I'm a cabinet minister. What, what makes Sandyford or Frendel Short or, 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 or Tillman Thomas or, or King in St. Lucia better than I am to be prime minister? Or even, even, even the man in England? Because you have advisors, you, you have advisors to advise you. You have central bank governors in economics, you have economic economists who are trained to advise you. You only have to be able to correlate and put these things together and, and, and be able to be prime minister. But my in politics was the honor of serving as a cabinet minister for 10 years, being leader of the opposition. And of course, the final crowning of that was when I was uh, uh, honored with an honorary doctorate by the University of the West Indies. I think that was a climax. In 1987, Sir Frederick was accorded Barbados' highest honor, the Knight of St. Andrew. I am honored to have been given Barbados' highest honor. Prior to my going, there was a lot of people in Barbados who, you, know, you get it for politics, the Queen, it had nothing to do with the, anybody. The Queen is head of state. I could have got it done at Government House by the Governor General Sir Hugh Springer. It cost me a lot of money to fly my wife and myself to England. But I wanted the public of Barbados to know that this honor is given by the Queen, not by Mr. C the Governor General. It has, he has to send it to the Queen. It is true she will not oppose any body whom the Prime Minister recommends through the Governor General. But I wanted to know that this was an honor that I appreciated. And she said to me, uh, Sir Frederick, uh, why, you could have had it? I said, ma'am, I want your gracious majesty to do me the honor. So when I need it, she did it. As someone who rose to the height of his career through education, Sir Frederick is sometimes taken aback that today's youth often take it for granted. But I have never in my life at Harrison College or Combermere studied by electricity. My parents and grandmother that I stayed with in Bank Hall and my parents in St. Andrew still had the light with cursing Lord with God bless our home. And this is something that when people listen to this, I never studied in my whole life, got higher school certificates, school certificates, junior Cambridge. I never studied with electricity. 
but I am satisfied that things are made being made too easy for these young people today. You know, half the parents didn't have the opportunity that these young people have. Free secondary education, free hot meals for little or nothing, free bus fares. This is an opportunity to make something of yourself. And I can say of my family, of the 10 of us, and this is another thing that I'm glad to see has changed, is that if your father in my day had money, he never spent it on the girls when it comes to tertiary education. He would send them to secondary schools but when it comes, he only had a piece of change, he'd send the boy. Because he feel the girl can get married to somebody and go about his business. And he going to be left in his old age with nowhere to support. I'm so happy to see that whole thing has changed. That boys and girls today, if they have the ability, are getting tertiary education regardless. But it can only happen because it is free. And I hope it remains that way. But we must take advantage because even today, it is still the survival of the intellectually fittest. It isn't the survival of the boxer, it isn't the boxer, you know, it isn't the physically fit. Today you must be in a position to argue, stand up for the right, know what you're talking about, and be able to hold your own in any conversation on any subject. A devout Methodist, he says, as he talks to God each night, he asks for three things. Serious prayers to God, my Creator. One is that I will come back to him with the very parts he gave me when I was conceived. No replacement hip, no knee replacement, no pacemaker, no nothing. Receive me back as you brought me into this world. Two, if I get a stroke and it is serious, don't leave me a vegetable. Take me home. And three, enable me not to depend on my children for support. If they want to give daddy something and love daddy, fine, I'll take it. But don't let me have to go to them and say, daddy hungry. And thank God he's answered all three so far. I don't know what life holds. His Christian life is of utmost importance to him, and he has served as a lay preacher in the Methodist Church since 1976. I believe in God. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and life to come everlasting. And I, as I say, I say my prayers, I read my, my books, Bible, all the time. Because I can, I, and I look back on my life, and, and as you get near to the grave, you start thinking. And of course, you don't know where you're going, and you're just hoping and praying that it is heaven. But I look back on my life, and I can see God's, when I see where I have come from, joy, to where I have reached, Loving parents, yes, but there got to be somebody who guided you and enabled you. I mean, when I was appointed Chief Justice of, of uh, Turks and Caicos, when I was appointed President of the Corps of Appeal of Grenada, in my whole life coming from poor, one pair of shoes, no pajamas, I lost my teeth because I never had a toothbrush to clean them when I was small. I mean, my grandchildren had to eat, got to clean the teeth. But in my day, you suck a piece of can and you feel that that would clean your teeth for you. And, and you these are things that, when I look back, there's got to be somebody who has brought me to where I am. And I hope that somebody, which I call God, will enable me to will receive me when my time comes. Sir Frederick Smith, family man, lay preacher, politician, lawyer, and a true Bajan.